we've seen two types of classifications. We've seen sort of a somewhat misuse of least squares from a regression to a classifier. Sort of worked, but was a little weird. And by adding in that sigmoidal nonlinearity, we got the logistic regression, which was a nice uh, way of cleaning up some of the messiness of just using straight regression with floating point uh, uh, results to a discrete label, and in fact, a probabilistic label because of the nature of the sigmoidal nonlinearity. And there are, of course, many, many different techniques for doing this type of classification. And we're going to talk about a few more techniques that are commonly used. So let me just remind you of what the problem is again. We are doing supervised learning classification. I have two classes, um, the blue and the red, with some features. Could be two features, could be one feature, could be 100 features, don't know. And the problem could be framed as, for example, um, one feature is a hemoglobin count, a red blood cell count, and one is a white blood cell count. And I want to be able to distinguish people who have cancer from people uh, who don't have cancer, for example. Or it could be something like, I want to be able to predict if the stock market goes up or down, binary classification based on, for example, um, uh, the number of tweets um, and maybe the number of Google searches done on any given day. Or maybe I want to do something like, Determine from somebody's age and the number of prior convictions that they have, are they likely to commit a crime in the future? Um, and do I deny bail or do I grant bail based on that? And so whatever your features are, whatever your um, output is, um, the classification is typically framed as a two, three, or four class classification problem. Okay? And we've seen a couple of examples already, the least squares and the logistic regression. Um, and here's a new way to think about this. And, and I'm going to just say right now is there's no necessarily right or wrong way to do it. You know, one of the tricks of learning these techniques is also learning where do they apply best. And the only way you can do that is by understanding the underlying mathematical techniques and the underlying assumptions. So perhaps this is the most naive way to think about a classification problem now with this really sort of binary classification is, what, what, what am I sort of doing intuitively? I'm going to put some kind of bounding region around here um, for, for one of the classes and a bounding region around here. Um, and I'm going to learn those bounding regions from the labeled data. And then I get some new point, the green one here. And what, 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 what could I do? I could say, well, what is, the sh what is the distance to the center of that bounding region for class one and class two? And whichever one is smaller, well, that's my class label. I mean, that's basically doing the simplest version of pattern matching. You are saying that this data point is more similar to these things than it is to these things over here. Sure, that seems like a reasonable thing to do. But what happens if the data looks like that? I mean, if the data are, in fact, clustered in a circle or a sphere or a hypersphere, well, fine. But what if they look something like this? where they're elongated in this direction and then elongated in this direction and you, you still fit that sort of that notion of a neighborhood, a uniform uh, neighborhood. Well, then this point over here, you know, maybe it looks closer to the red than to the blue, but on this graph, it doesn't quite seem like it is. So that kind of simple clustering may not be such a good idea because you, you're inherently in assuming something about the data. All right, so maybe instead of trying to bound the data, maybe we should think about it as a separation problem. How do I separate the data? Okay, so I have class one here, I have class two here, and maybe what I want to do is draw a division between them to say anything that is uh, down and um, is going to be one class and anything that is up is going to be another class. That's another way to think about the classification problem. Um, Maybe I can think about it in this way. What if I fit a line to the data? I mean, those data actually lie on a line. And then if I project all that data onto a line, well, then I've got a pretty simple classifier. I can just draw a midpoint here and say anything here is one class and anything here is another class. That's a different way to think about it. Well, then what if the data, though, looks something like this? So if I fit a line to this data, it's going to look something like this because we're trying to fit some measure of goodness of fit. And if I project onto that line, well, uh-oh, now I'm in a lot of trouble because all of my data points have gotten completely mixed up. So notice that in all of those examples, drawing, for example, a circle, um, splitting the data in the middle, 
uh, fitting a line to the data, we were inherently assuming something about the distribution of the data. Now, if your data is in a two-dimensional space, you can visualize it. And if it's in a three-dimensional space, you can visualize it. But as soon as you get more than three dimensions, we don't really know what this data looks like. And so we have to be very careful on how we think about this classification and what are the implicit assumptions we are making about the distribution of the data. Now, in this example here, um, when we had that we didn't want to fit this way, what if we fit sort of perpendicularly to this and then projected everything onto the line? Well, that would actually work really great. That's sort of perfect. It's almost the exact opposite of what we had done when the data were living on this line. Um, so how do we build a classifier that can sort of deal with these different distributions of data without having to explicitly know them? And um, the first technique that we're going to look at is called linear discriminant analysis, sometimes called Fisher linear discriminant after the mathematician Fisher. And what linear discriminant analysis does is the same game that we've been playing. It's going to come up with an objective function, and it's going to maximize or minimize that objective function. Um, and what this uh, objective function is going to do is it's going to minimize the within class variance and maximize the across class variance. So what do I mean by that? So instead of assuming my data are bounded by circles or sphere, instead of assuming that the data line along a line, instead of assuming really anything about the data, what I'm going to do is say, I would like to project my data onto a one-dimensional space such that it minimizes the within class variance. And what I mean by that is that the projection of all of the blue points should be very, very small. And the projection, the variance of the projection of the red, the other class, should be very, very small. That is, all the data should get bunched together wherever I move the data to. And I want, that's the first part of this, and I want to maximize the difference between those two classes. Well, that makes good sense. What do you want for a classifier? You've got a bunch of points in some high dimensional space. We're going to project it into a low dimensional space. And what do we want to do? We want the data to be very far apart from each other so that we can draw something in the middle and separate it. But we also want these things to be very tightly coupled so they're not spread all over the place and we don't know where the data are going. And that's going to be the linear discriminant or Fisher linear discriminant, which is what we're going to talk about next. So we have an objective function. Uh, minimize the within class variance and maximize the across class variance. And now the question is, how do we solve that optimization? All right, let's start by defining a few things. I've got two classes, blue and red. Um, I'm going to define uh, the blue class as x sub i and, the, and the, the red class as y sub i with nx and ny data points each. No guarantee that they have the same number of data points. So xi is f1, f2 um, for each of those data points or whatever dimensionality. Notice, by the way, here I'm not assuming any dimensionality, although I will draw it in two dimensions. Let me define a few um, terms. I'm going to compute the mean of the first class, the x class, as simply um, the center of mass of all those blue points. So mu sub x is 1 over nx, the total number of points, times just the sum of all the x sub i's. And that's that little guy right there, it's just the center of mass. Uh, mu sub y is 1 over ny times the sum of all the y points, that's that guy right there. So that tells me where the center of mass is for my two classes. And mu is the overall mean of the entire data set, which in this case is something somewhere near the origin, which is just 1 over nx plus ny, total number of data points, plus the, uh, the sum of all those. So think about just the center of mass of regardless of the label of all the data. So I have three means. Each of them are just a point in the same dimensional space as x and y. Let me define two matrices now. These are the data matrices. These are the zero mean data. So all I'm going to do is define the matrix MX and MY. Um, MX is X1, the first data point, minus the, the mean of that class, and then X2 minus the mean up to X and X minus the mean. So think about taking that blue um, uh, cloud there and just zero meaning it on top of its mean right there. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the y matrix. I'm going to subtract the mean of the y data points from each of those. And so those are, now those two clouds are essentially both sitting over the origin because I've subtracted their mean. Okay, so those are the two data matrices. 
And now I'm going to compute the covariance matrix. So the covariance matrix is simply this matrix MX times MX transpose, which tells me how much things covary in each of the directions. And I have another one for CY for the Y data points. All right. Now, two more matrices and we're almost home. I'm going to define the within class variance and the between class variance. All right, so remember I said that CX and CY were the covariance matrices. And remember that the whole objective of linear discriminant analysis is to minimize the within class and maximize the across class. So I'm going to define the within class um, matrix SW as simply uh, the covariance matrix for the X class plus the covariance matrix for the Y class. And I'm going to define the between class variance, how spread apart are the classes, as the following. Mu x minus mu times mu x minus mu transpose. Think about that as the variance along, the one, along this, this dimension. And then mu y minus mu times mu y minus uh, mu transpose. So this is telling me something about where is mu x relative to mu relative to mu y, the between class um, uh, uh, spread. Okay, so now I have these two matrices. SW embodies how distributed the, the data is within itself, and SB embodies how distributed the center of mass is of the two classes relative to the entire uh, data spread. And the, to, to minimize the within class variance and maximize the across class variance, we're going to set up a generalized eigenvector problem. And I'm not going to derive why this solves it. I'm going to do this very operationally because the derivation is a little tedious. What I want to tell you is that if you want to maximize the within class variance and minimize, sorry, minimize the within class variance and maximize the between class variance, then we're going to compute the generalized eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue that minimizes the within class variance and maximizes the, the uh, across uh, the, the between class variance. So in particular, um, remember what a generalized eigenvector is? Let's remember what an eigenvector is. The eigenvector of a square matrix is a vector that is simply a scaled version of it, where the amount that it's scaled by is the eigenvalue. A generalized eigenvector takes two matrices as input. In our case, it's the between class um, matrix, uh, covariance matrix and the within class covariance matrix. So E is a generalized eigenvector of two matrices, SB and SW, if SBE is equal to lambda SWE. So this is the new part here because we have a second matrix. The eigenvector with the maximal eigenvalue lambda um, is, the, um, is the, uh, the, the axis that will maximize the across class variance and minimize the within cross variance. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, now what we need to do is just visualize this and see what that eigenvector is. But let me just rewind a little bit and make sure we understand where we are. We don't want, we want to try to make minimal assumptions about our data as possible. So we don't want to say they live in a circle or a sphere. We don't want to say they are spread out across a line. And so what linear discriminant analysis does is it says, take the data, find a, a linear subspace that you can project onto such that we maximize the spread of the two classes but keep the classes very tightly coupled. We frame this as an um, optimization um, that did exactly that. Maximize between, minimize within, and that turned out to be a generalized eigenvector problem for two matrices that embody those two variances. So what's going to come out of this is an eigenvector. And now the question is, well, what do I do with that eigenvector, and how do I do classification? And that's what we'll do when we come back.